Disney Star Trek. It's the 50th anniversary. <laughs> We're going to have a guest on in just a few minutes. John Jackson Miller is going to talk about his new book, Star Trek Prey. People literally don't know much about this trilogy that he's made writing at all. And we're going to talk a bit about Star Trek Beyond. So you two, hold your horses. We'll talk about Star Trek Beyond when John Jackson Miller shows up so I can talk about Mass Effect at the same time. And we've got Gaston as well. Gaston's <laughs> Ewan McGregor, right? Uh, no. Gaston is Luke Evans, sadly. Oh, Lumir is – Ewan McGregor is Lumir, though. I'm for that. But – so Star Trek. Star Trek is a series that I – was aware of growing up. Uh, Next Generation was on. I knew Patrick Stewart instantly as Star Trek, um, and I knew Worf. Um, I didn't watch the original series really until I was probably a teenager. My mom and my dad really? bought for himself the entire series on DVD, which cost like three hundred dollars. And like, you don't just yeah, mind to see by yourself this. Um, actually, he bought it for himself, and then my mom found it and hid it until Christmas. <laughs> so that <laughs> like, here, had honey, here's a great Christmas present. Something you've already bought. I've seen all the original series, and then once I got to college, I uh, watched all the movies. Not in sequence, but I, I've watched all of them. Um, the only ones I've ever seen in theaters, of course, were the J.J. Abrams ones. Um, the, the first J.J. Abrams was actually the first one I was really excited to see in theaters. I've seen a lot of DS9. I haven't really seen much of Voyager or Enterprise, sadly. Um, Can a man go into the old man vault for a moment? Old man vault? Okay, what do you see in their okay, presence? old man vault for a moment. Are there presents? There are no in the old man vault. Okay, there are people out the there. That, listen, it's a vault full no, of old men. It's just no. Listen to me for a moment. Seven of nine is in there. Probably, and I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> but meanwhile, we have to understand is that there are people that remember this show even longer than I do. Like when it first came out, my mother being one of them. Um, a duh. But I, I <laughs> remember. No, I remember the first Star Trek I ever saw in theaters. I was brought to it. I was about a year old. I remember the experience. My mother had to remind me what movie it was. But I was in the theater to see Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, 84. Okay, I was trying to figure out which one it was. I'm like, I know you were a baby during Return of the Jedi. No, 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 no. 84, Voyage Home. 84. Probably okay. the best of all the movies. I disagree. Uh, yeah, Storm, that's it's cool. Fine. Fine. No, 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 nope. dude, it's fine. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine that you disagree. You're allowed to be wrong. That's okay. What I'm saying is this. Got a whale of a tail to tell you like. <laughs> whale of a tail to tell. Oh, here we go, bro. Tales I love. Not like this for the moon above. A whale of a tail, and it's all true. You keep your Come on. No, whales. keep going. You're on a roll. You keep your stupid whales. Oh. Do you guys I, know I, I don't like that one. Tell how heavy a space whale no, is. What? <laughs> At a space At, railway station. Star Wars Rebels oh. did an homage to Star Trek IV with yes, a whale up. Yes, I know, I know. Um, so, here's so the that's, thing. Yeah, so you're way, way back before us. Way I back. Think, um, and I was the in the middle, so See, my first then... film was this, which was not the best film to start with. But I did obviously watch the seasons before no. that. Yeah. Was it Generations? Was that your first film? My first film was Nemesis. Oh my god! I, saw it at cinema. I did see some oh. on TV before that, and I've obviously watched loads of TV series before that. But the first Honestly, film I saw at the cinema was the illustrious Nemesis Top of the Billing Nemesis. Okay, <laughs> I think I can talk you though. The first one, first Star Trek film I remember seeing, I saw on TV, and it's one where they directed by Shatner, where he <laughs> needs, goes to find God, yes! and he finds giants, v. and they all got better from there. The Vinyl Ventier. But that, unfortunately, <laughs> is the movie after the one I saw. So, um, being the old bastard here, what I'm saying series. is this. See, but, no, <laughs> seeing Star Trek evolve, the, the point is seeing Star Trek evolve from what it was to what it is now, there's there, there's definitely a difference between like what we call the Abramsverse and the original universe and all that. Isn't it called the Kelvinverse now? Whatever the hell you want to call it. I don't care. The point is... I think it's called the Kelvinverse. It's all amazingly well-written stuff and whether you like it or not star trek is probably one of the few franchises in the history of film media of entertainment that's been able to reinvent itself still be relevant after all this time and still draw people in and i think that's the important thing to focus on the fact that star trek much like star wars is an all-binding thing I, I am going to get on one soapbox, though, because I have to. 
the Star Trek Discovery is coming out. It looks interesting. Um, I'm not the happiest that it takes place ten years before the original series. I think they could have picked a different yeah, like time to fit in. But I'm, but I'm excited for the show, I'm excited for the series. But I am pissed <laughs> off at how they're distributing it. In the U.S., we're going to see the pilot on CBS. That's fine. From then on, you have to see it on CBS All Access, $6 a month if you want ads, like uh, $12 if you don't want ads. You have to stream it there to get the rest of the show. Everywhere else in the world, for the most part, is getting it on frickin' Netflix or they're getting it on public television. Why do we have to pay for CBS All Access that isn't even available to the rest of the world when I can just go to Canada and go, I'm watching it on Sky TV, suckers? Because this is why we pirate television and movies. That's, it, it, so it, it is, is interesting it is that they're I mean, the idea of paying to then have the privilege of getting adverts is just completely Yeah, no, backwards. seriously, I'm not, I'm not paying. I'll, you know, I'll be the first I'm one on to your say. side on that one. And, and uh, I can't remember if you, if you have any idea what channel it is on in the UK, but I think it's on one of the ones we don't get for free and as part of a subscription. Hey, so whether you get it for free or not, whether Canada gets it for free or not, that's not the point. The point is, is that if you look hard <laughs> enough, if you're outside of the US, you can find it for like, way more of a decent thing or on something that's broader already. Like, they couldn't have licensed this to Netflix for a small fee. You know they could oh, have. They'd, still, yeah. they'd have made more money than they could shake a stick at. They're just and being it's one of those things people. that there's... Like, like Game of Thrones and some of the other big ones, people yeah. actually do care about spoilers from this, which means they're not going to wait five months for it to come out in some other format and be available on Netflix or whatever oh, hell else. No. Hell no. And that's what why I'm telling you right now... Every every Star Trek fan that has a freaking internet connection and understands how the internet works, which is like the majority of us, we're all going to find a way to watch this for free because there ain't no way in hell we're paying. We're not paying extra. We have Netflix. You want us to pay? Then do it there. All right. Um, but I'm excited to see it. You oh, know, it, it's interesting that they're doing a 13 episode well, and 10 episode season, you know, so that they can, you know, just tell a, a Game of Thrones S story where it's shorter, more condensed versus. <laughs> Yeah, you know, some some Star Trek seasons are really long. Absolutely, don't make a twenty four season. I mean, this, the US does this all the time. Episodes. Make, makes twenty four or a million episodes in one season when you could have done it in four. And the UK does the opposite, where it needs ten episodes to tell a story and it does it in two. It anyway. Does it in three? So, <laughs> sure. could we have some middle ground ones? I really love Netflix for that because Netflix will have one season that's twelve episodes, another season that's thirteen, and then another season that's eleven because it went. How many episodes do or we have? No, and, and you're eight. absolutely right. It does it? So um, I respect that greatly, and I think this is the right length. I'm excited to see what they do with it. I think it's going to be fresh. Um, I don't think it's going to feel very and similar thank God to it's not Funimation. Voyager and Deep Space Nine. I don't think it's going to feel similar to the animation. I don't think it's going to feel similar to the films. So it really is going to be, let's see what happens. And I'm, I'm excited whenever we have that. And 50 years after the original has come out, and we are not really sure what we're expecting, and you know we're optimistic and hopeful for it. And, um, and to be honest, the, the, the current... Apple world that we're in, it feels very much like the aesthetics of the original Star Trek. Everything is white and plastic and tablety. What's the deal with that? Um, you know, it's it's quite exciting actually. I think um, Star Trek really was when it first came out the epitome of what we wish the future is going to be like, and today it still represents that in in many ways. Um, and Star Wars is, 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 is a, you know, we've talked about it million, millions of times in terms of the differences and the fact that Star Wars is a space opera and Star Trek is a science fiction franchise and, and, and Star Wars is about the hero journey and Star Trek is about the um, universe that you're in and, and, and that kind of um, looking out into the, the the final frontier, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I do and like it how this is going to be the first series with a female, uh, with a, they said it's the first one with a female lead, but it's not exactly true. But Boy, with a <laughs> main female as many thing, there's going to be gay characters. It's going to be more, more adult. Thank well, God not we on, need more. It's, it's not on public not television, so yeah. they can, they can get away with more on it. Um, it'll be interesting because Brian yeah, Fuller, of course, is pushing get daisies. Away with. I just want, I, just make the guy did Hannibal yeah, on NBC. Yeah. Have yeah. you seen Hannibal? They got away with so much on NBC. And he's a pushing daisy. He's a very good showrunner. He did write for DS9 and Voyager. I'm looking forward to it. I'm hoping it looks great. I'm hoping it's fun. And I'll see it eventually. I might not see it when it airs, uh, but I'll see it eventually. I'm in grad school now. Good luck me seeing anything when it airs. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm looking forward to it. And 
I do hope folks he's not that... kidding. He's really not. He 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 doesn't even see when the show comes out and he makes it. <laughs> no nope. But I I'm I, I do think though that we're gonna get some great stuff um from Star Trek in the future. We know enough a fourth movie's happening with Chris Hemsworth coming back as uh Chris Pine's dad. Um we know yeah, we're gonna, gonna get weird. We we've gotten some good comics recently. Like I, I read the Star Trek um Doctor Who crossover, which was fun. I read the Star Trek Green Lantern crossover, which Started out as fun, um, you know. There's some there's some great stuff coming with Star Trek. I'm glad it's alive and well. There's even an MMO coming out, I believe, on PlayStation Four, um, a free one for it's Star Trek. So out. You can get to it on Xbox. Awesome, it's doing well. I'm glad. And uh, you know, when it comes to the series, I'm just gonna say my personal favorite as a series is DS9. As a cast, yes. Yeah, because we could have an Patrick entire Stewart show. Is Patrick frickin' Stewart. No, but no, we could have an entire show series. about DS9, and you know why? I'll give you two reasons. And because it's one nine seasons of long of no. the Dominion War awesomeness. No, well, no, no, because because well, actually, you know what? Only one real reason. Two words: the Cisco. <laughs> okay, no offense. The G- Star Trek: The Next Generation is great, but every time Q shows up, Picard argues with him and tries to outsmart him. Freaking, what does Cisco do? I will punch you in the friggin' head. <laughs> and then he punches Q in the friggin' head. And Q's all like, Picard never hit me. And he's all like, I'm not Picard because I will whoop your ass. Dude, Cisco, yeah, I'm not, rock on. I'm not a, a big fan of Deep Space Nine. It's actually my least favorite outside of Enterprise, which of course is everybody's least favorite um, of the series. Um, I, for me, Star Trek is about the exploration. It's about going somewhere. It's not about staying in the same place. <laughs> Poke the bear. Oh, not know. staying in the same place. Okay, uh, okay, okay. okay. Damn it. <laughs> meanwhile, uh, I do like. I do like how they have. They do have all these uh, Donald Trump Ferengi memes. Yes. Make it, but, make no. America acquire again. But DS9, I th- I thought felt the deepest when it gets into culture and gets I into think, these characters. Yes, I, I and the Dominion not, War is yeah. something the biggest. It's really the biggest event you've seen in the Star Trek TV show. Like it was, it's yeah. a it's big. You don't have a ship that's leaving to this go. Space it's a is, war. Is Star Trek's Empire Strikes Back? It might be the best made. It might be the deepest storytelling. To me, it's less Star Trek than the other Star Trek, and that for me is why I'm not, I don't enjoy it quite as much. Uh, the same way that for me, Empire Strikes Back isn't as Star Warsy as A New Hope or Return of the Jedi. Um, but that, that that doesn't mean that there's a lack of quality. And actually, even Enterprise, which I didn't enjoy very much at all, was still a very good TV program with high production quality, good acting, good scripts. Um, good story and and you know I could I could stick on a single ep- any episode of any of the shows and with a few exceptional episodes in the first original series um, I would probably get to the end of it without wanting to cry so that's a bonus um, <laughs> I, I I'm, I'm really looking forward to the new one I'm oh. actually I've I've only ever seen random episodes of uh, of Voyager in Deep Space Nine. Um, and I'm watching my way through Next Generation at the moment, so I'm probably oh, going to end up watching all the way through uh, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, you know um, and the new show, which... Uh, you know what? I, last... I, I will tell you this, Jason. <laughs> uh, Jason, I'll tell you this. If you want a series of Star Trek that is Star Trek-y, quote-unquote, you need to just watch Voyager from start to finish. We could do a whole oh, episode yeah, yeah, yeah. on this. All I'm I mean, going to say I, I, is this. You want to see – no, you want to see a starship get dumped into deep space where they ain't got no contact with nobody? Voyager. Yeah. And it's yeah, amazing. I, legitimately, I, and I absolutely love Janeway as well, and I think the Voyager is actually massively underrated. It is – it is exactly what you want from Star Trek, and it's, and it's what you what we really should have got something similar to that as the new films, um, is, instead of the sort of reboot that we have got. And I tell you what, I know we're going to get into Star Trek Beyond later, but kudos to the guys who are playing the cast, who over the course of three films have become much more like the characters we saw in the old Star Trek. Um, I was very impressed in Star Trek oh, Beyond that sure. how much they were emulating the originals without it looking tacky and forced. Oh and, no. I- no. Well, there is no. there is a story though from 2009s when, you know, when Leonard Nimoy was on set, um, he liked Carl Urban's portrayal of Doctor McCoy so much he was he kept on crying because it reminded him of his late friend DeForest Kelly, of course, who, who oh, died. Yeah. And Leonard Nimoy would cry whenever he saw Carl Urban's portrayal because it was so spot on in 2009, and now it's it, he's. It's- 
Carl Urban's probably the, the, the when best I just copy. It and thought they must have CGI'd the original somehow. It's so spot on. <laughs> and the see, only that's one that's what not I'm really there is Scotty, um, uh, who doesn't quite look like the character, shall we say? But the, I, I, I think they'll get there. They've got another film or oh, two. Eventually, in, uh, eventually to, to, they will get there. But what yeah. Jeremiah is saying, though, about Carl Urban, before you even say it, Jeremiah, I'm just going to stop you there. He's not a copy. He's not. He He's is an actor. No, he is a perfect interpretation of something that we know and love. He is literally like a modern version for those of us that still want that, but we can't have it, and we well, were that's, that's able all to experience it uh, properly. That's where was, that comes from, and that's why I think that he did, and not for nothing, but I think that honestly, I'm pretty sure that if you put William Shatner on set – he'd probably cry the same way about Zachary Quinto yeah. to Leonard Nimoy because that's damn spot on. It's beautifully Spock. done. It's Spock on. It's be- exactly. It's beautiful. <laughs> no, it's beautifully <laughs> freaking done. Absolutely guy, amazing. We got to invite John Jackson Miller in. He is on and ready to talk some Star Trek prey, and uh, I think we need to talk some, uh, you know, uh, Star Trek Beyond with him because I – Without further ado – John Jackson Miller. Welcome to the show, sir. Hey, how you doing? I am doing great, and uh, James, Jason, and I are ready to talk some Star Trek. We're talking the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, and with Star Trek Prey coming out in just a couple of weeks, we are ready to go. Oh, sounds good. So, um, you know, I, we're going to start off on something that's not Star Trek Prey, but still Star Trek, because uh, I, these two guys didn't see Star Trek Beyond uh, when I told them to, <laughs> and they recently just saw it, and uh, they both really want to talk about it because it's a great movie. Um, so I, I'm just going to ask you right off the bat, being that you've written in Mass Effect and you've written in Star Trek, were you surprised as how much of a influence or direction they went when it came to Mass Effect, especially Mass Effect 2 with collectors and so on, influence they took with Star Trek Beyond, um, moving away from seeing the more Star Wars feel to the more Mass Effect feel? Uh, well, I'm not sure necessarily that that's how I would have described it. I I probably have never made that connection before just now. Uh, well, they look like the collectors. They swarm like the collectors. Their base is like the collectors. There's a very much. Uh, there's a lot of collectors in there. Well, it's it, basically it's a CGI thing, <laughs> and true. And so I, you know, I, I kind of don't know that it's any, you know, more uh, uh, complicated than that. And it's it's also hard to imagine, uh, you know, Star Trek being influenced by, uh, you know, too much outside of well, Star Trek itself, and then. Uh, of course, you know, back in the day, you had it being influenced by, you know, various other, you know, clearly, you know, Star Trek, the motion picture was influenced by 2001 to a degree. Uh, they wanted it to look majestic and everything like that. And then, you know, Trek 2, you know, they go more in the, uh, you know, let's have it look more like, a, you know, Star Wars battles uh, going on. And, of course, you, you get Industrial Light and Magic in there anyway. So, uh, these... Yeah. <laughs> so 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 yeah. There, I mean, there are there are going to be those kind of influences. Um, I think it's a stretch to visualize these things necessarily coming from a video game. Uh, not that people don't play video games or aren't into them, uh, but uh, remember, we're talking about uh, a movie that cost 150 million dollars to make. Uh, yes. So if you're going to be influenced by something else you're going to be influenced by another movie that made a lot of money <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. and so that would and so that would be my guess uh you know i i you know I'm, I'm again i didn't make the connection myself but then those things move so fast it was very difficult to know exactly what they look like <laughs> so as a as a writer in in star trek and uh you know a lover of science fiction in general how did you feel they did as far as not not far as promoting it because we know Paramount CBS fight and 50th anniversary has been kind of an odd year for them. But as far as Star Trek Beyond, do you feel it was a beyond how they promoted it a good tribute to 50 years of Star Trek? Well, I think it was a solid movie. I mean, it it was uh, you know better than the other two, uh, and in my view, it was designed to be a mission. It was designed to be self-contained, uh, and that's always good. Um, 
you know the the second movie you know as as i mentioned in some other discussions probably was trying to uh you know write some checks uh, you know, that uh, based on uh you know credit that it didn't have yet uh, or that the characters didn't have yet uh you know you can do the uh, the ending of wrath of khan in uh, a in you know 1982 uh because by that point we know that this kirk and this spock have been together for many years and we we have known those characters together for uh you know 25 years almost actually not 25 uh, at that point it would have been uh getting my math wrong it's uh, closer to 16 years uh whereas you know we have only seen uh chris pine and zachary quinto together for all of you know three and a half hours uh but yeah by by that point and so it, it you know it, it kind of wasn't you know time to do that if it was advisable to do that at all and and i've you know, I've I've always said it's 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 always a question whether you really want to, you know, do one of these you know re remixes remixes or reboots where you just sort of shuffle everything around, um, and you know reverse roles or that sort of thing. Uh, you don't want to just have it be the karaoke version of, <laughs> of the original of the original shows uh, or, or or another movie. So this was an original movie, an original plot. It stood on its own. Um, you know, I, I thought the, uh, the first half hour was, uh, was strong. The first hour was really strong. I think, you know, dealing with the, with the villain and his scheme, it gets kind of foggy, uh, a bit, but even so, uh, a, a lot better than, uh, a lot of people I think had been, had been fearing. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, I, and, and as far as, as far as, you know, exactly how, uh, suitable it is for the 50th. Uh, I like the callbacks that we we got in there. Um, you know, I, I actually kind of expect that they may now be done with callbacks, uh, you know, because they, they've done this here. Uh, but it was, it was, you know, the, the only kind of thing, I guess we've got maybe two things in parallel to that. Uh, we've got Doctor Who's 50th and and James Bond. And that was going to, that was the next one I was going to mention was uh, Skyfall. Uh, so that was, uh, and you know, I, I think that, I think that, you know, they, they really went the, um, you know, more or less the Skyfall route, uh, which is to tell what was 90% a new story, but have significant callbacks in there, you know, with the Aston Martin <laughs> yeah. s sitting out there. I was sh kind of surprised that, that they did, you know, specific callbacks to, you know, I, I wasn't surprised to the original series, but like. Star Trek Enterprise. They did callbacks to the designs and ships of the Enterprise, of Star Trek Enterprise, which, you know, a lot of people bash on, but they did it really well and reminded me I need to watch that show. Well, um, you know, with, yeah, I mean, it's part of the continuity, and you know, I, I think what they have done a really good job of is, you know, uh, respecting that uh, you know the the stuff in the other timeline happened, and uh, you know, it, it's it's all it's all still there, and it's. Uh, yeah, it's something that they can do in Star Trek in a way that you can't really do in Star Wars because in Star Trek we already had mirror universes. In Star Trek we've had time travel. In Star Trek we've had a bunch of different other, uh, you know, ways to go that the the MoU has uh, has given us. Uh, and you know, with Star Wars, uh, you know, there 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 isn't really that uh, ability to do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, actually that this, you know, Skyfall came up when, you know, Leland Chi and I were discussing continuity, uh, just after the Disney purchase or sometime after that, but, you know, before any you know, decisions, I think had probably been made about how they were going to go forward. Uh, we were shooting the breeze at some point, Leland being the, 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 uh, you know, keeper of the holocron. And, you know, I think one of the things that, that I had brought up in the conversation was that James Bond does something pretty interesting, which is, uh, that there's this sort of cognitive dissonance between this, the the individual movies and the past. You know, they this they sort of exist. Uh, little bits and pieces of the earlier films exist, and of course the the Aston Martin is uh, is evidence of that. And so when you're watching uh, Daniel Craig 
you can sort of imagine that, yes, he encountered a guy sort of like Goldfinger, uh, but it probably didn't look anything like that movie that we saw. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's another way to go. And again, with Star Trek, I, I think they, they went a way that they could go, which, which was, uh, you know, to make it a, an alternate reality. So, uh, James and Jason here just saw Star Trek Beyond for the first time, uh, the other day. I think James actually saw it today. So what did you guys, uh, think? Any questions or comments? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I think that, um, uh, each of the films of, of, of the new universe have, have been very distinct from one another. The first one was create a viable path for a reboot, um, or not necessarily reboot, but you know, a different continue, a different continuity. Um, and what it did was reintroduce us to the universe, reintroduce to Vulcan and, and the cast and, and, and give us all of that in a movie. And that was really the purpose of it. And there wasn't much retreading aside from some of the, the kind of, um, standard character uh, aspects. The second one, to me, was was kind of intended there as a blend of Wrath of Khan and uh, Star Wars, um, with a lot of callbacks. Uh, and and the third one, I think, has has been okay. Right, let's start standing on our own legs and actually going and and doing something new. And I'm really excited to see what they do in the fourth film and 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 whether they go for the kind of approach they went with with Star Trek Beyond and went for that sort of episodic. You know, imagine if we had two hours to tell an episode of Star Wars, uh, Star Trek, um, uh, and we were trying to make it that kind of blockbuster film. Um, and uh, you know, Star Trek has had a lot of films that perhaps haven't had the right pacing, have been a little bit too slow, or have had clunky plots. Um, trying to make it feel like Star Trek in terms of the episode, but trying to make it feel like a big blockbuster film, I think has worked for Star, Star, Star Trek Beyond. It's actually my least favourite of the three new ones, but that's because I really, really enjoyed the other two. I thought it was uh, I thought it was a standout film. I thought it was better than I was expecting it to be. Um, and I thought, as, as I've already said to you guys, I, I thought that the character portrayals in particular were spot on. Um, I thought that they, they, they did very, very good jobs of, of emulating the original uh, original cast whilst bringing something fresh to the table um, and I've always been a bit of a, a Simon Pegg doubter outside of straight comedy films and I thought he pulled through here and, and, and it was fantastic um, I'm actually really interested to know what uh, what um, John um, you think about the future of, of, of Star Trek in terms of Star Trek 4 and whether they are going to just do another Star Trek 3 or whether they're going to go completely out into the uh, beyond the final frontier into the unknown well, you know, you never know what is going to happen because once we're talking about, you know, future films, you know, at that point you really have, uh, you know, the 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 front office is involved. I mean, you have you have a, a lot of investors, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of attention uh, that gets paid to these big tentpole movies like this, uh, and so you know, it. I think it is harder now. Uh, to do something that is a smaller, more personal film, um, uh, or uh, than it has ever been for these things, uh, and so yeah, that that's going to be the, the the question. Uh, I will say one of the things that I came out of the theater believing and uh, or thinking, uh, and I, I'd have to actually, you know, I, I'm 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 not I'm not sure exactly why this is. I think it was because Peg wrote it. And Peg was, you know, played a supporting character. I would, uh, I cannot remember another of the thirteen movies, maybe Trek Four, uh, where the rest of the cast had such a balanced lot to do. Um, everybody got scenes, uh, and that was that's not something that that you know, and certainly the actors have have lamented. That you know they don't always get uh, you know a, a a the B plot line or the C plot line uh, or a D plot line or a plot line at all in some of these movies. Uh, this film, uh, it was actually kind of hard to tell what was the A plot line, what was the B plot line, what was the C. Uh, you know they they had equal weight, uh, and so. You know that's that's certainly going to make uh, you know Peg a uh, an actor's writer for sure. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. And and uh, you know if they keep to that, I think that's uh, that's a that's a winning formula. It's just a matter then of trying to craft it around something that uh, you know is is gonna you know, deliver the the you know, the big 
uh, money that uh, I think a lot of these movies just unfortunately as a fact of uh, financial life uh, have to deliver. Yeah, like the end of the the second one, a lot of people thought, oh, the next one is going to be War with the Klingons. But no, we we didn't go there. And I think that was a smarter move, but they could always go back to something. Well, like I, that. I was delighted it was not that because I think I think the <laughs> yeah. cardinal sin of of uh, Into Darkness was remaking Wrath of Khan uh, and uh, making it less interesting. Uh, but I understand that, uh, that others do not, don't do not agree. Uh, but <laughs> I, I think that I think that I agree with that in terms of the the filmmaking. I just think that Benedict Cumberbatch was so great in his role that he managed to carry us beyond that um, I, I, and, and I ignore think, it. But, I, I agree. But what I would say is, let's call him somebody else. John Harrison. I agree. No, I, call him John Harrison. He could have been another one of the hundred odd people who were the same as Khan, um, but in a different in a different visage. And I, I, I do think they they, they retried a bit closely. Um, the other thing that's I, I think is interesting. It was 2009 was the first one, right? The new the new Star Trek. So we've had seven years. So three and a half years from now is almost exactly release date of Star Wars Episode Nine, if that's when Star Trek Four comes out. So to what extent is the timing going to influence things? Are they going to try and go exactly the opposite direction, make it a bit slower and a bit more Star Trekky to try and uh, avoid making a, a direct comparison with Episode Nine, or are they going to change the pacing of of how slowly they release the film, or you know, how do you think that's going to impact things? Uh, if if that's if that's a question for me, I guess what I would say is I think the odds of them selecting a, a movie date now this far out are uh, inconceivable. Uh, you know, they they, they it, it, it's it's inconceivable that they would actually say, ah, well, that we're doing this in three and a half year increments. I think it's just happened that way. Uh, and you know, as with the Star Wars movies, they kept thinking they were going to be coming out in May, and now they've settled on December for these things. Uh, so you know, one thing about these blockbusters is, at least in the United States, uh, you know, the the film uh, production companies don't really necessarily uh, you know have total control over uh, when these films open. Uh, first of all, you know, obviously they, they can run into delays in filmmaking. They can have to go back and, and you know rewrite the the script. Obviously, that has just happened. Uh, yeah. uh, and yeah. and you know you know, you could you could get to uh, you know call it 2019. You could get to 2019 and realize that uh, every weekend is already booked up by Disney, 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 and uh, you know two other. Uh, tentpole movies and and go someplace else. You know, you'll have to go someplace else. So yeah, I I don't know. It it would you know, it's it's interesting. Star Trek films have opened at all different times uh, that I can recall. I and uh, it, it's just uh, you know I I think we I think they've come out at Thanksgiving at times uh, and uh, you know. Uh, it, it's just it really is a function of what else is out there. I, I yeah, was discuss, I was discussing another conversation with somebody a few days ago, uh, Trek Five, and the fact that it came out in the most blockbuster heavy summer of the '80s, and uh, you know, sandwiched in between Indiana Jones and uh, Ghostbusters Two was the next week, and Batman was the week after that, and Lethal Weapon Two was like two weeks after that. And there was just no hope of that movie staying in the theaters, uh, you know, more than a week and a half. <laughs> so regardless, and that's regardless, and that's what hurt. Yeah. Oh, sorry, and that's what hurt Beyond because Star Trek Beyond came out in July, and then the next week yeah. was um, Jason Bourne, and the next week was Suicide Squad, and it just it just couldn't keep the screens, um, which is sad. You know, I think the next one they'll probably move it to probably an an easier month, like in April or March, or maybe in well, May, like May I, worked well I, with the other I two. I actually think it's unlikely to be that. I think it's likely to be the July before episode nine comes out, just just because of the timing. It's about three three years for them to make yeah. the next film, I think, and I think the timing will be that, that it's likely to be July. But the other big franchise we've got coming out at a similar time is when's Avatar 2 and Avatar 3 coming out, because that might be also another massive science fiction franchise with, with a similar release date as well. And again, uh, you know, what's the impact of that going to be? So yeah, I know there's, there's, it's kind of wild speculation at this point. I was just curious to, to to know whether you thought that they'd likely play it safe and, and go a bit um, a bit less Star Trek Into Darkness um, direct comparisons to to Episode Nine, um, which I think probably is going to be quite a hyped and uh, an expectant uh, film. Well, here, episode here, Nine. Well, 
Here is what I would do, actually, and I, I don't know how they do this, and I wouldn't want to actually echo it. You know, the, uh, you know Star Trek IV, you know, uh, 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 the Voyage Home, uh, that was the biggest box office movie that we had in the, in the Star Trek line, I think, until uh, uh, eight. I think it was until uh, – I can't remember exactly whether it's an adjusted dollars thing or not, but, uh, but uh, uh, First Contact, I think, might have beat it out. But one of the things about four was it uh, – because of where it was set, it was ridiculously approachable. I mean anybody could go in and see that movie. Uh, whether they knew anything about Star Trek or not, because it was set on Earth in a certain amount of time. I'm not saying that it would necessarily be a time travel film, and certainly, yeah, it would uh, it would you know, suffer from the same callback thing that I was just talking about avoiding. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think it's it's possible they could look for ways. It makes it a cheaper film for one thing. <laughs> That's true, and they do, and they probably will need to cut the cost. But um, Jason, one thing to worry about: here's why summer 2019 probably won't happen. Here's what they already have booked: in April they have Shazam, they have Fast and Furious Nine, May they have Avengers Four and Star Trek Nine, June they have Justice League Part Two, Incredibles Two, Transformers Seven, then it goes Bad Boys Four, Indiana Jones Five, an Illumination animation animated film. You know, there's lots of stuff in there. Yeah, I do I think they'll probably move to that. I mean, Indiana Jones. Well, five is true. going to come out that summer, and but, I, know, but they probably will move there, it to a less crowded time, like a March, maybe, like Batman v Superman did. Maybe, but or maybe they'll push it. Might it might be well. You never know. But sure, uh, they could push it to November. It is interesting. But yes, I think I think uh, uh, Jeremiah, Jason, and John Jackson have spoken a lot, but James has not spoken <laughs> much. Too many J's today. <laughs> what, what, Holy cow! We are the four J's now. <laughs> now we are a quartet. Oh, well. Get James, James, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, just don't make us sing. That's the key. That's uh... oh, we already sang before. Oh, We're okay. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, James. Uh, do you have anything to add? I don't or even did we know bury where you? to go from here. We've been everywhere. Where, where, where do I even begin? I, I did want to touch on that whole thing from the very beginning of the show, the Mass Effect Star Trek link. And the only reason I say that is because I'm a huge fan of both franchises, and. I'm watching Beyond, and literally I'm thinking Mass Effect the whole time, everything I see, from, you know, um, what is it, uh, the station, dang, I can't remember. Yorktown? Yorktown, yeah, no. Yorktown yeah. Station. It's like a globe version of the Citadel. Yeah. All yeah, right. I, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That. However, you know, clearly both of those things were influenced by, you know, the fact that it's it's a real, you know, conceptual notion to begin with in science fiction so uh, oh, absolutely. so absolutely. Uh, there yeah oh no no I, i'm absolutely there with you on that one all i'm saying is that these things coincide so when you look at the you know larger picture of time that is spanned between when science fiction became popular way back in like what the pulp you know serials 30s 40s even the 20s and today that these two things kind of sort of came out in relatively the same era and if you're fa if you're a big video game fan, which a lot of people are, you can't help but notice those similarities. Like uh, Krell's his all of his guys in their like suits, it, it, you know that reminded me exactly of the collectors. You know the the whole concept behind it. You know it, it just it seemed so. In terms of in terms of what you what you're saying, James, about the comparison, I think that there are probably my, my hunch is that the they wanted a way of bringing down the ship, and they wanted a way of of introducing this um, the, the slightly more isolated, the slightly more split up gang um, that, that we got in the film, and that was was very much a, an idea early on in the script was to have this kind of swarm hive type thing going on and i think that was probably unique to it and then everything else in terms of the designs of the different locations probably came from people doing concept art probably who were inspired by a great many different areas uh, and and the similarities are quite fierce so there probably are some links in there but yeah i mean as uh, as jjm says we've got a million different science fiction stories that have domes or bubbles or spheres well yeah, absolutely yeah. Or... Yeah. <laughs> yeah but that's just one part of it yeah. And there is nothing new under the sun or, or around the sun, as in the case of uh, you know. The, I think that I think the uh, you know, the the inspiration for a lot of these things is Ringworld uh, by Larry Niven, uh, True. and uh, of course that was actually around a sun as opposed to you know. I'm glad they didn't try to do anything uh, you know that size. Uh, <laughs> there's only room for one Dyson sphere in Star Trek. 
Uh, and yeah. <laughs> we've already seen it. So, um, you know, when we're talking about the 50th anniversary, one of the big events book-wise, the 50th anniversary, is your trilogy, which is coming September, October, and November. And uh, Star Trek Prey, which I was asking my Star Trek fans, like, uh, you know, um, I believe you know Eric Cohen, but he's, he's our local Trekkie. He was supposed to be here, but he, he wasn't. And, you know, asking people about Prey, they know nothing. Basically, it, it's been kept under wraps quite a bit. Um, at least as far as the general stuff goes. So we're going to talk about Star Trek Prey, which reading about it is fascinating how it literally covers from the right after Star Trek Three: search for Spock to right after Nemesis. Yeah. Um, was this trilogy conceived of as a 50th anniversary tribute to Star Trek or was it – I it just happened to be that. Well, it, you know, the where things wound up on the schedule, you never know exactly where they're going to be when you, you know, pitch anything. So that that wasn't, uh, you know, my in my initial conception at all. The whole idea, though, was for a trilogy at the beginning. Uh, I wanted to tell a uh, a political thriller, uh, something that was uh, along the lines of. Uh, and you know, the, here's here's the nothing new under the sun uh, thing here. Um, you know, you have all, all those paranoid uh, thriller movies, uh, political thriller movies of the '60s, uh, like Seven Days in May, which imagined a coup d'état against the United States president uh, by uh, by Burt Lancaster, one of the generals. Uh, and, you know, and then of course there's all the attendant Cold War movies like Fail Safe that are in there. Uh, what I wanted to do was to tell wow. a story. To tell a story, uh, you, you recognize that movie, I guess. <laughs> that's, yeah. That, that's no, no, movie. I do. I I love those old, like what you're talking about, those old like '60s, like Cold War paranoia, like action adventures, some yes. huge kind of films. Love them. Well, Absolutely what I love them. What I wanted to do was to tell a story like that in the Star Trek context, where I was able to, yeah, and most of the most of the books take place in the Next Generation, which. Uh, the time frame that we're in is a little over seven years after Nemesis, uh, so it's 2386. Uh, it takes place over three months in 2386. It takes place in real time. So if you were actually reading the novel in September, the, the events of that novel take the place of one month or take place during one month. The uh, second book is the next month. Next novel is the, ne is, is the next month. That gives me the chance to take an incident – or a series of incidents and a conspiracy and really sort of spin them out uh, and and show not just the effects on the individual players uh, but also on the society uh, on the on uh, you know the on the Klingon Empire the uh, the regular folks uh, that are caught uh, in the middle of this thing that happens uh, and so I, I wanted to do something. Uh, like that, and uh, you know, I also since there were a lot of beats in the story and a lot of things that happened, I needed that amount of space to be able to tell it. Uh, because uh, again, there are uh, you know, it's a it's a three essentially it's a three hundred and some odd thousand word novel <laughs> that is being serialized here, and uh, it is it is really designed to uh, you know pull people along. And uh, you know, there's there 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 are several mysteries involved, which is one of the reasons we have kept a lot of this under wraps. Uh, I'm beginning to talk about more of it now because the the books are starting to get out into the wild. Uh, but you know, I I wanted to really do something that would present a huge challenge to the Federation and their relationship with the Klingon Empire. Uh, they have been allies, uh, you know, pretty much since. Um, since the Cardassian War, uh, and the uh, they in the novel chronology, uh, they have been facing off against what's known as the Typhon Pact, uh, and basically this is a uh, you know a, a collaboration of ne'er do well uh, groups and outsiders. Uh, it's the Romulans and the Breen. Uh, and a group we created for the novels called the Kinshaya, uh and uh, the Senkethi, that's another group that's in it, the Gorn, they're in it as well. Uh, and uh, so essentially what they are is they're the counterforce against, um, you know, if you want to consider the, the, the Kittimer powers, the, the signatories of the Kittimer Pact as the NATO powers <laughs> in this Cold War story, you've got that there. And what I'm doing is I'm driving a, a significant wedge here between 
uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Federation and the Empire uh, over uh, a, an event that has its roots, as you mentioned, back with uh, the search for Spock. Uh, in the search for Spock, there is this villain played by Christopher Lloyd. He is Krug. He is a uh, commander. Uh, he is very much a Empire first kind of guy. He doesn't want to see the uh the you know the he you know, his his whole thing is he never wants to see a federation banner flying over uh, a klingon's head anywhere uh he clearly would have detested everything that came afterward uh you know his death is more or less a precondition i would say for what happens in star trek 6 the ability that they have uh to you know make a peace uh and go forward uh, and what uh, our story uh, imagines is uh, that Krug, uh, like many major you know, uh, Klingon generals or Klingon commanders, is the head of a house. Uh, he, his house is uh, the, uh, the leader uh, in the development of uh, birds of prey. And, of course, uh, the bird of prey makes its first appearance there in uh, Trek 3. My favorite starship, possibly in all of <laughs> science fiction. I mean, I've I've, yeah. I've had one sitting over my desk, and I've been uh, a model of one for the last year. And I've had the I've had the Klingon Bird of Prey uh, operator's manual at the ready because it's got all the schematics that I need. Uh, because I, I I spend a lot of time on these ships in in this series. Uh, and uh, and what happens is that there is a battle for control of uh, his house. Uh, and it is settled exactly 100 years before our next generation story takes place. In the next generation, the uh, the uh, Federation, uh, it, one of the things that's happened in the in the in the continuity is uh, Riker is now an admiral. He has leapfrogged over Picard because Picard has taken. Captain Kirk's advice from generations, and he's never going to let anybody take away the Enterprise from him. He's always going to stay in the center seat. Uh, Riker has kind of taken on this job as a uh, a fix-it man for the uh, for you know, a, you know sort of a diplomatic go-to guy uh, to to deal with things. And uh, he is charged, and he brings uh, Picard into it uh, with uh, the job of helping the Klingons commemorate this event because it happens that this battle a hundred years ago took place on a planet that is now in Federation space. I won't say what happens after that, but that is the kickoff. And we discovered that there is this entire thing that has been going on since back in the day. Uh, there is a, an heir of Krug, uh, 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 a would be heir to Krug. And uh, there are, uh, a lot of things you can do over a hundred years uh, if you're uh, a Klingon and if you believe what they say about revenge. And do I need to repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> no. So, no. so I, uh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I gotta say this. I want this book. <laughs> three books. Three. Yeah. So, yeah, I just, I there just wanted to three... say as well that I think this 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 is exactly what I've always wanted from uh -huh, from, uh, uh -huh. from Star from Star Trek books. The the problem that we have when we get into the the sort of politics in in Star Trek is you don't have enough time for it to breathe properly. This this kind of thing isn't you know it isn't completely um, without. Uh, um, without previous examples in Star Trek, there are points where you know heads of the Federation are actually under somebody else's thumb or, or are secretly working for some other group or whatever. But in the space of one hour or two hours or in the space of one day in world, suddenly this entire thing suddenly turns up and disappears again overnight. And really, you want those months and months and months for that story to tell. So I'm really excited about that, and I'm I'm you know. Uh, well, one, I, one of my one of my models for this, you know, speaking of that, was was Star Trek VI, which is very much a Cold War paranoia movie. It is it is one hundred percent that uh, one of my favorites. It it, 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 it is it is you know uh, you know that there there's your seven days in May in terms of uh, oh yeah so of, true this is so McCarthyism at its best it, exactly I mean it's it's the tension that that is the the exciting aspect of it and and you've got the twists and turns as well but if you if you have twists and turns without any real um, fear without any real um, tenseness. Then, then, uh, then, then, what's the point in a way? Um, well, having the ability to to, to juggle both is uh, and keep it keep the whole thing in suspense whilst having those twists and turns is is what 
um, makes it so exciting. See, we, uh, we, we, we look back, though, at six, and we realize that at least in, in – you know, they, don't, they never say how long the events of Star Trek VI take place. Uh, how long do you think it takes to get from the explosion on Praxis – uh, to the Kittimer uh, uh, conference. Uh, well, let me just take a months. poll. Six, six <laughs> months, I'd say. Anyone else? I, I several months, maybe. I, I, I okay, we got Jeremiah for two. I guess three weeks. Who knows? I've, I've got no idea. I don't I, really know. I, 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 <laughs> I would have to go back and look, but I think it's actually something like less than a week. Oh my right. God. And, oh, wow. and I and I'm not sure where that came from specifically. I think it might have been layered on it by flashback, which is the uh, which is the 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 Voyager episode where it shows what Excelsior was doing during the uh, events of the of the series. Or, or I'm sorry, yeah, the events yeah. of the movie. Uh, oh, and yeah, yeah, and, yeah. That. And yet, and that is, and yet, that is one of hundreds of things that I've used as a resource for this. Oh, uh, but, 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 but basically, you know, things have to have progressed really quickly uh, to to have all the pieces still in place. Because how could Enterprise have stayed out as long as it did? You know, incommunicado. Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, sabotaged uh, communications or, or whatever they ended up doing. It 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 wouldn't hold water if it took much longer than that. But they didn't have time to show all the beats that it would take to really have this thing ramp up over the course of months. Uh, that would be a four-hour movie or a six-hour movie or a season of a TV show. This well, it, what it, I it's similar to Game of Thrones and House of Cards and you know those those kind of you know, grand right. schemes that do take seasons and seasons and seasons of space. Well, this is a full season of a TV show across three novels. That's that's the way I approached it. Um, it, it is it is it has uh, there. I should say there are there are uh, original series sections in it. Uh, we do have flashbacks where we go back, uh, but the flashbacks are not just to uh, not not just to fill in backstory. There's actually some fairly important stuff that happens, uh, and some of the participants in that day. Are actually still around uh, because the Klingons live, you know, more than a hundred years, and so do some of our other people. So uh, it's it, it, there. There's just so much fun stuff that's in here. As I say, there are some significant mysteries in here. Uh, I'm, I've I've cautioned everybody about spoilers to a great degree, uh, but uh, I I really do feel that you know this is a, this is a story where. Uh, you know, I, I've taken the last year and a half on it. Uh, we we had time to do it right, uh, and I can't think of anything I would do differently at this point. So I'm curious. So this is three 400 page novels coming out back to back to back. So you said how it's basically one 300 thousand um, word story. So when you wrote it, was it considered as a trilogy, or is it considered a story that just got really long? Or else, how would I've never seen release dates where they literally let you write your trilogy, and then release them all back to back to back. Usually it's finish one, write the next one real quickly, finish that one, write the next one real quickly. Uh, how did you get it set up, or is it just luck that they've done, you got to do your trilogy like that? They've actually done that before with the Trek novels. Uh, the uh, you know, I, I think um, Cold Equations was done that way, uh, where it was by one author, and it was three novels. Uh, and it's simply a matter of you know, holding on to the later books and not releasing them as soon as you get done with them. And I like it because, you know, the, the, the thing is I have been able, because of the fact that they, you know, I yes, I wrote the first book at the end of last year. The second book was in the winter, and the third book was in the spring. But I was doing proofreading on all three books in the summer, and I had them on my desk simultaneously. Uh, and while that felt like a lot to do, what it meant was there's a, you know, unification of elements in the story – uh, the continuity, at least within itself, ought to be ironclad. I mean, you know, I don't have anybody who uh, his name is spelled one way in book one and another way in book three. Uh, I don't have anybody who's an only child in book one and suddenly has siblings in book three. Um, and I, I was also able to go back and really lace in a few, uh, you know, because occasionally a story will evolve as you're writing it. 
uh, I was able to lace in some, uh, you know, some foreshadowing uh, and take characters that appear for the first time in book three, and I was able to drop them into book one. And so it really will read, you know, uh, you know something that I, I've, I've, I've thought about a lot is the way that people read novels now. Uh, when people in the future, and I mean after 2016, read Prey, they're going to read it in one mass of three digital files or three books. They're never going to know it came out monthly. Uh, and I want it to read like it's one thing. Uh, you know, that's not possible if you do it, you know, a novel that comes out every six months, although that's, that's one way that people do things. And it's also certainly not possible in comics. You know, where I had Knights of the Old Republic coming out over the course of, uh, you know, five and a half years, there was no way that I could, you know, three years in, go drop a hint or something back into the first year because that was already gone and published and out. So, uh, Jason, um, I know it's like three in the morning when you are. He actually stayed up. He's in England. He stayed up so he could talk to you. Um, do you have anything to add now while you're more coherent um, than you will be in 20 minutes? Oh, well, I, I will be fine. I, I enjoy talking about this. It keeps me very much awake, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's not a problem at all. Um, and I think that's, that's absolutely fascinating. And actually, um, a, a thing that I was, I was doing recently, I've, I've been watching a lot of the this kind of older TV series, uh, watching kind of the classic TV series that I've, I've never got around to watching. And a lot of them end on a season cliffhanger that, you know, you've got a whole year between it and the next episode, and I just skip to the next episode and watch it straight back to back. And oh, oh, great, that's what happens. Okay, fine, never mind. Um, and uh, and yeah, that absolutely, absolutely. That, that with books, I've often I've often caught up on books that that were released uh, several years apart, and 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 I've read them back to back, and it, it does lose some 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 focus. So I'm glad that you're you're thinking about both eventualities. And um, my question, um, my my last question before I zip, it, and I Jeremiah's got a bunch more questions on this on this area. Um, is actually I've got a few more questions as well, but less about this book series itself. Is which characters are we going to come across? To to what extent are they characters we're already familiar with? Are you introducing new characters? I know you've mentioned new species um, uh, or, or new races or new um, you know, groups of uh, of entities. Um, are are we seeing the story focusing on newer people more or on the people that we're familiar with? Well, there's both. Uh, certainly, probably the the you know, the the antagonists, and there are quite a few of them, and they're working at cross purposes, which is always fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, that I introduced, uh, you know, the, I, the the aforementioned uh, would be heir of Krug, uh, a gentleman named Korg. Uh, he is uh, one of the certainly the the most important through line characters in the series. Uh, we also, uh, you know, on the on the the hero side of things. Uh, yes, I uh, certainly have Riker and uh, and Picard uh, uh, aboard their individual ships. Uh, this event is so big that it pulls in uh, Aventine, which is uh, the the ship that Esri Dax runs. Uh, and uh, I, I got to do a whole sequence with her and Riker and Picard in uh, uh, the first no Trek novel that I wrote, that which came out last year, which is called Takedown. Uh, and uh, yeah, as for the as for the uh, so those are all th those are our captains that are involved here. Or actually, again, Rikers and Admiral. The uh, possibly uh, the major character the, or the lead uh, in in many senses in this book is Worf. Uh, it is a Klingon story uh, yes. in, large, in large measure, and uh, you know, Worf is uh, Worf is uh, for reasons I can't get into. This story has a hugely personal impact on him. Uh, I had my suspicions that might be the case. I didn't want to ask directly. <laughs> and and no, and see, for, I was gonna no, I was gonna ask. I was gonna ask. I was gonna be like, we get Worf. Is there Worf? We get you Worf? get you get Worf. Worf gets more screen time, I think, than any of the heroes. Uh, yes. Now, complete, now yeah. I also will say that there is a supporting character, and I, I think it's okay to mention this that we have not seen much of. That gets a lot of screen time, or uh, uh, screen time. Why do I keep using this? Gets a lot of page time. Uh, as, Will Wheaton? Uh, Will Wheaton? No. Whatever works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, there's there's a certain gentleman that we only saw once in the uh, in the uh, Next Generation. Uh, he got his own novel in the late 90s. 
uh, and the character has appeared in the recent fiction about five, six, seven years ago in a short story where he retired and went away. Uh, and uh, he has a famous name. His name is Kalis. Uh, Kalis is, is the, the, uh, the cloned reincarnation of Kalis the Unforgettable, uh, sort of the George Washington or the, the founder of, of the Klingon Way. Uh, and of course, there's even a even a, you know, a a book out there, the Klingon Art of War, which are all uh, all of his sayings. Uh, and uh, and I bring him out of retirement for this, and uh, we'll see what role he has. Uh, I enjoyed the heck out of writing him because uh, you know to get into the head of somebody who is both, um, you know, he 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 has Klingon blood. He has uh, he has uh, you know, he has the, the wants and needs and desires of, of any would-be warrior, and yet he was born to be this figurehead. He was born to be this person who uh, had all the exploits, who had all the victories that he never had. Uh, so that's an interesting thing to explore with him because, uh, you know, it, once he knows he's a clone – uh, he's he's got a different angle on his own life, uh, and uh, and you know I I enjoyed writing him as well, and uh, you know other characters. Uh, Tuvok has a pretty large role uh, in this. One of the big things that we have is because there's a conspiracy, and there's mysteries, there's an investigation that's going on. Uh, Tuvok plays a significant role in that. Tuvok in the novels. Uh, he has been in the crew of Titan for uh, the entire run of that book series, um, and uh, and so he's you know, sort of been the Spock to Riker's uh, Kirk uh, in many ways. Uh, and I have always enjoyed writing him. The, the first Star Trek uh, short story I did, uh, which was a Titan story called Absent Enemies, that was also sort of a Riker – uh, you know, Tuvok buddy cop kind of a story. So yeah, this is this. It was good to get him in as well. Uh, again, there, there, there. Are, uh, I, and I would also throw in here that uh, people who have been looking for a, a Klingon trilogy that really is a deep dive into Klingon philosophy, uh, this is it. I referred to just about every resource I could get my hands on, uh, and. Uh, there's even a lot for the fans of the Klingon language. Uh, I don't pretend to know it, but I was uh, able to work with somebody with the Klingon Language Institute to create some new words for us. Uh, and yeah, I think we got everything spelled right, and if we didn't, uh, it's my fault. Fantastic. It's time for the epic. I mean, if, if, if it doesn't go well, you'll be lynched. But if it goes well, <laughs> then you'll be the, oh, the hero well, of the Star Trek speaking, universe. Speaking of it going well, how were I've, – I've, I've never – quite figure this out when it comes to writing literature and so on i know star trek uh pretty much has, is like doctor who where the movie the novels of the novels and uh, the movies and the movies and the shows and movies and so on um uh, star trek I mean, star wars is different but how are fans how are star trek fans in relation to star wars fans as far as like when something new comes out if they disagree are they more vocal just as vocal is it similar how how they act when you write something if they disagree with something, or well, the the communities are of, of different sizes to be sure. Uh, in, in terms of uh, you know the the uh, obviously a Star Wars movie is going to come out, and uh, uh, you know there's a, there's a regular TV series on uh, on the Disney Network, and there's all this other stuff out there. Star Wars also maybe skews a little bit younger. Uh, you know, I I was able to do some stuff in. Uh, you know these Star Trek novels that yeah you know, I'm I I will say I am writing probably at a higher uh, you know level in terms of uh, just the vocabulary that I'm using and certainly from the science and the pseudoscience I mean my lord uh, <laughs> you know I uh, I you know there there are whole paragraphs of techno speak that I have Jordy who has a pretty good role in this too. Uh, you know, say that you know, if I tried to put that into the mouth of a Star Wars character, I would be lynched for that, uh, probably <laughs> by my editor. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, but you know, certainly, you know, they care about things just as much being right uh, and being reflective of the characters. Uh, you know, when I started with Star Trek, just with that uh, with that Titan storyline, 
Uh, I did a more lighthearted uh, uh, story for that that short story, uh, where you know it was kind of you know, it was kind of more of a trouble with tribbles feel to it, uh, and it was maybe a little bit too light, uh, and that was why I start out with a short story before moving on to a novel, and then a novel before moving on to a trilogy, so that I can get you know fine tune where people want to see these characters or expect to see these characters. Um, in their fiction. And, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to tell something that's true to myself, but also true to the TV characters uh, on the screen. Uh, but I also, you know, it's incumbent upon me to kind of know what's going on in the other novels in the sense that, you know, if, if these characters are always, you know, uh, uh, you know depicted one way, I want to kind of be close to that. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it is, you know, it's a, you know they they have their own uh, Wikipedia in Star Trek. It's uh, they actually have two. They have Star they they have uh, Memory Alpha for the for the uh, TV shows and the movies, and Memory Beta for the literature, the comics, uh, some of the games. Uh, and uh, you know there is you know, some interplay uh, you know between the communities in the sense that uh, well the uh, uh, Kristen Beyer, one of the authors. Uh, she does, I think, the Voyager novels. Uh, she's in the writer's room for Discovery. Uh, she was hired to be that, and she is the intermediary, uh, you know, that's working with uh, the uh, licensees. This was just announced this last weekend at New York uh, at the at the Star Trek Mission New York event. Uh, she is helping David Mack. Uh, on the uh, novel that he's doing for Discovery uh, and also IDW uh, for the comics that they're going to be doing. Uh, again, you know, this is this is something where, you know, I think there's a little bit of a lesson that's come from, uh, you know, s the success, I think, that uh, the story group has had, uh, you know, over at Lucasfilm of making sure that uh, all of these different things do interact as well as possible. Yeah, this was this is my big pseudo Star Trek question that I had for you. You between Star Trek and Star Wars have now written in three universes. <laughs> um, more, more, the, more than three. More than, <laughs> Halo, well, Mass Effect. Yeah, there Star are all Trek, the others Star as well, Wars. but I but specifically <laughs> thinking sure. about the the Star Wars expanded universe and and the Legends and and, and sure. the old storyline where there were were thousands of of, uh, of of reference points across comics and and books and films and everything else. Um, versus the the very concise and small uh, when you wrote for it uh, new canon, um, which which pretty much was just the films Clone Wars and I think maybe um, one other book I can't remember if there were, how many other books were, were there before when, when uh... well, new, new, new Dawn was the first book. Uh, was it the first yeah. the first canon book? <laughs> yeah, and and <laughs> as, a, as as a consequence, I did not really have to change my game much because I didn't I didn't I didn't know that book was going to be the first I didn't know that they were going to be rebooting or doing anything like that until I was two thirds of the way through the book and uh, makes sense. and then I simply uh, you know because I always try to write every novel as if it's somebody's first um, you know Star Trek Prey it does follow on in the sense that you know the characters from the other novels, the 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 you know the uh, the ancillary characters, the crew. Uh, you know it, it it's true to that continuity in the novels, but I introduce everybody. You don't have to know anything about it. You don't have to know anything about Riker being an admiral. That's all. That's all introduced. I do that in Star Wars as well. And so you know every book is somebody's first. Every comic book is somebody's first. Uh, and so I didn't have to do a lot of of changes like that. Uh, what we did do with Star Wars with A New Dawn is we went through and took the opportunity to scrub some of the neologism, some of the words that had seeped into Star Wars over the years uh, to, you know, make things sound more science fiction-y. Uh, you know, the 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 uh, the main one that I I got rid of with permission was refresher. Uh, I was going to say, fresh is the one on the top of my mind. Yeah. Uh, uh, for some reason, shower is a refresher in Star well, Wars. It's well, what is a <laughs> well, actually, a shower is a refresher, but also a bathroom is a refresher. We never yeah. quite figured that out. So, uh, yeah. 
So, you know, we, we, we sort of, uh, you know, I, 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 I got to bring the toilets back to the universe. <laughs> um, and, and the thing is, you know, why do these things have these names like this? Uh, well, you know, yes, sometimes things actually are, you know, functionally different. A turbo lift is not an elevator because it goes in multiple directions. Uh, it, it doesn't just go up and down. Uh, so to call it an elevator is incorrect. Uh, calf needs to be calf because there is no such thing as uh, the plant Arabica coffea uh, in in Star Wars, which is where the word coffee comes from. Uh, so there, you know, we we can't actually do it that way. Uh, uh, but with something like as I as I as I say the the bathroom, uh, you know, where does that come from? The desire to have those words like that that really comes from pulp science fiction of the 1940s and 50s where in order to make things seem otherworldly, uh, they would give things these fancy Captain Video kind of names. Um, you know, uh, 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 hand me that Aquatron, son. Oh, you mean the bottle? Okay, yes. Uh, <laughs> that's, it, it, and it was, it was it, it, and the thing is, Star Wars does not need any help to seem otherworldly. It's fine just all the way it is, so... So that was one of the things that we did you know, when we did that. I also tried to get rid of turbo lift at the same time, but I think that one crept back in. Turbo lift again, you know, that seeped in from Star Trek. It didn't come from Star Wars. Yeah, so so I guess on on, on uh, two things on that. The first one is how different is it writing with the sort of Star Trek story group compared to the Star Wars story group, and the second one is, the, you know, the buzzwords, the the science fiction universe, and I know you've mentioned in terms of the jargon, but uh, is is there a completely different language that you have to use in the way that you write to to write Star Wars compared to Star Trek? Because you know, Star Wars is sometimes, uh, particularly in the films, is more space opera, but mm-hmm. in, in the books, often from one book to another, change tone a bit. Well, I, I I I think I think you're right about that. Uh, on on the first part, uh, there's a smaller group over in the Star Trek uh, end of things. However, there are many more authors playing in the novel part of it. Uh, so there's there's a you know they are coordinating uh, with the story group at Lucasfilm. One of the things that they're doing, which is new, uh, is that they're actually pushing content towards us. Here's characters that can be included in your story that will pop up later on. Uh, you know, there's, there's, and it's going two ways, obviously, because we've had characters, you know, my, my Ray Sloan character uh, in Star Wars, A New Dawn, then appeared in multiple other novels and short stories, and she's also appeared in the Marvel comics. Uh, and that's because the Lucasfilm story group is aware of these characters and is pushing them out is 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 bringing them around uh to appear there uh and uh you know the uh you know, then you have uh you know the, the ability to actually uh you know give us hints about things uh that we can drop in the novels uh that's something they can do there particularly because of of how they're structured uh they know what's happening in the TV series rebels was done specifically in concert with the executive producers of the Rebels cartoon. So I had the story Bible for the first season. You know, I had the, you know, the interaction with them to be able to drop a lot of hints. Uh, and so, so that, that, that is different. Star Trek, of course, um, you know, for one thing, there's, there's quite a lot, uh, you know, less that I'm going to run into in 2386 in the continuity uh, because it hasn't been written yet. Uh, because there's nothing else going on around there. Now, if they were to, if they were to suddenly decide that discovery was going to take place in 2386, that would have made my life more complicated. Uh, but but it, it it wasn't an, an issue there. In terms of the actual vocabulary, uh, yes, you're certainly right. Uh, uh, you know, the style that I have to approach these things with Star Trek uh, is uh, more of a science fiction more of a hard science fiction than, than Star Wars is. Um, I'm a hard science fiction fan, actually. I mean, you know, I was an Arthur C. Clarke guy. Uh, I, I like things that work. I like the physics to be correct. Or if the physics aren't correct, I like the metaphysics or the fake physics to be consistent. Uh, and, you know, in Star Wars, when I would include that, I would have to sort of do it around the fringes um, because 
we already know that we've got a galaxy here where there's sound in space. We already know we have a galaxy here where, you know, inertia is just you know, not even a thing when it comes to uh, spaceships stopping on a dime. Uh, you know, we, there, 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 are, there are stuff that we're just going to accept uh, as part of the premise of, of where we're at. Uh, and we're not going to drop, uh, you know, 10,000 words into a novel explaining things. Uh, so when I would put things in, I would hide them, uh, sort of, or I would, uh, you know, for example, you know, I would I would make sure in Knights of the Old Republic, uh, when you know the characters were right above a planet, uh, you know, uh, right above a planet's day side, that we weren't seeing stars in the sky over it because that they probably would not be visible. Uh, I. Uh, tried to make sure that explosive decompression worked the way it's supposed to. I tried to play, you know, honestly with uh, as as much stuff as I could without calling attention to it. Although there is a section in A New Dawn where we're talking about blowing up a planet uh, and the mechanism required to do it, and I had to get into the details, and I put it all in the mouth of a particular officer whose job it was to give us annoying exposition like that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's where I could do it. Now, over in Star Trek, I can make a whole plot point out of, uh, out of something, uh, you know, scientific or meta-scientific. Uh, that absent enemy story I mentioned uh, actually is a pretty long uh, dispensation about phasing. Uh, phasing is what we saw happen in, uh, in that episode of Next Generation where Jordy gets uh, caught in in between dimensions, so he's actually passing through walls. Uh, I get to explain sort of how that worked uh, in my uh, story and how it was that there was a phased Romulan that was somehow able to sit down in a real chair. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, you know I, 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 that is something where, you know, the different milieus, you have the ability to, to you know, it kind of, uh, use a different story uh, set of tools. So I think that's almost going to wrap us up. And this, James, do you have any questions before we uh, before we begin wrapping this up? I'm just, or are you good? I'm just going to sit here and just be <laughs> like wow to everybody who's out there. <laughs> and I'm not even being facetious. Like, oh my god, I want this. Well, <laughs> it, it uh, the, the books come out. They're all available for pre-order now. Uh, uh, people can actually use the link bit bit dot l y slash capital s capital t capital p r e y r e y as lowercase one two and three, and that goes straight to the Amazon link. Or just Google Star Trek Prey, and they can pre-order all three books now. Uh, you know, I, I really do think. It is uh, something people are going to enjoy. Last week of September for all of those. Uh, just to quickly mention the other things I've got coming out. Uh, two Halo books. Uh, one is uh, called Halo Fractures. It is an anthology of short stories set in the Halo universe. Uh, and it includes stories by other Star Wars uh, authors, uh, Christy Golden and Troy Denning. Uh, and... Uh, then as well, uh, I have a star. Uh, sorry, I have a Halo graphic novel that's coming out in October. Uh, uh, Fractures is coming out in September. In October, Dark Horse is doing a book called Halo Tales from Slip Space. Uh, these are all uh, stories that were, uh, that follow the events of uh, uh, of the the fifth game, uh, and uh, that's again something where there are a number of stories in there. Uh, by uh, you know people that we people will be familiar with, uh, and uh, then I have uh, all of my Mass Effect work, which we mentioned earlier, is being reprinted by Dark Horse in an omnibus edition, which comes out uh, in November. Uh, my Knights of the Old Republic comics, uh, Marvel is reprinting the second of the three volumes that will encompass the entire 1,200-page storyline. Uh, that comes out uh, in a, a Marvel Epic Collection in March. Uh, and in January, uh, Titan Books is putting out uh, – this is yeah, yeah, one of the other franchises I've, I've stuck my toe into. Uh, there's a book called Planet of the Apes, uh, Tales from the Forbidden Zone. Uh, and these are all short stories by, again, a number of authors. Uh, many of the Star Trek uh, author crew are in this. Uh, and uh, – and, 
Uh, these are stories which were inspired by the original five Planet of the Apes movies that came out in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, mine uh, takes off on uh, Escape from Planet of the Apes, where they all go back to 1973. It is so much fun. And so it is – it's a lot of stuff that's coming out, uh, but uh, you know, I, I feel good about all of it. Fantastic, and yes, yeah, so, yeah, he definitely underestimated with how many franchises you're in because <laughs> you're in almost all of them. I know how many franchises he's in. <laughs> no, I was just that's saying that's there are only two franchises, no, three universes. Of... It's the interesting. I'm actually really looking forward to the Planet of the Apes one. Uh, there are some other fantastic authors in there as well, and uh, I saw uh, your Facebook comment recently that you enjoyed writing that a lot more than a lot of the million short stories you've written in the past as well so you've been busy (laughs) i I think it's the most fun i've had writing a tie-in short story i mean because i i i was able to write sort of a pastiche about hollywood in 1973 because there is that you know element in that movie where um you know they they do become members of of uh, you know, uh, society there for a, a brief time, uh, and they're very high-profile celebrities. And I, I wanted to you know, talk about what it would be like to actually, you know, be in a world with them uh, if you were in show business uh, in in 1973. And uh, and and it's it, and it's and it's fun. And I think it's also you know it's honest to the, the storyline. It's not it's not you know silly or anything. Uh, but yeah, I, I appreciate the chance to get on, on here and talk about this. Uh, people can find me on the internet. Uh, on Twitter, I am at JJM Far Away, uh, and then on uh, the web, I have a site FarAwayPress.com. I have a behind-the-scenes page there on every book, every short story, every comic book I've ever done, uh, with trivia and all sorts of other things. Well, thank you so much for being on, and I can't think of a better way to celebrate 50 years of Star Trek than have you on to talk Star Trek Prey, the trilogy which is coming out this month, next month, and November. You guys can, of course, buy them all at Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, I even saw Walmart um, had them up there, oh, so wow. go, get them, go get them, guys, and uh, celebrate 50 years of Star Trek. And if you haven't seen it yet, go see Star Trek Beyond because it's a great movie. It's a lot of fun, and uh, thank you. Um, John Jackson Miller, and uh, thank you so much for being on, and thank you, Jason. Thank you, James. And uh, we're going to wrap up our episode, folks, so if you want to follow us, we're on Facebook at Bombay Radio, Twitter at Bombay Radio, iTunes, Stitcher, Geek Factor Radio, YouTube, we're everywhere, and I hope you guys are celebrating 50 years of Star Trek because it's a great franchise, and there's at least one Star Trek show, which is for you, and at least one Star Trek movie, which is for you, and if you haven't checked out the books yet, start with Star Trek Prey. It sounds awesome. Thank you.